I think there's another thing that, that intrigues me about when we come to the reclining figures. When mm. I went on to the Met online, mm. I was looking for recumbent figures or objects, and it was quite a struggle to find them because I'm interested in the idea of the... So we're all very alive and alert <laughs> at the Met. <map. laughs> anyway, I'm interested in that idea of something that's collapsed but still holds a great mm. dignity and power and even monumentality in its collapsed form. And when we come to the reclining figure, this is almost like a reclining figure that's been made to stand up. And I, I find that fascinating as well. I think the sort of Christian obsess obsession in its iconography with dead and half dead flesh is, is I don't, is there another religion in the world that has as its iconography <laughs> strapped up half dead <laughs> figures to bits of wood? I mean, it is extraordinary, you know. But even even this is using the how to reduce religion. <laughs> 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 Sorry, yes, I, I don't mean to be offensive. No, no, no don't, yes. I don't want to be offensive. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. I mean, it's 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 an extra. But it's such an extraordinarily. Mm moving moment to mm. capture mm. and then to attach this great religious um, whatever it is authority to it and is, course, yeah. is extraordinary. And of course in a know. way that I suspect the, the sculptor didn't mean it to be resonant. This is made of something that's dead. I mean this is a... This is a but this it's is more a, than that. But it's more than it? that. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean I th oh, it's, sorry, it's a problem. To, I, to me it's, it's superb but I can't quite get beyond the virtuosity which I am admire enormously but I think it makes it for me sort of creatively vulnerable and I'm quite interested what about in the what about the preciousness of the materials because I mean in a way that's something you 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 resist isn't mm. it in your work I mean your, I want to make a really stupid comment that you can come back I just okay. sort of wonder why you would be given a piece of ivory or bone. Mm -hmm. Where would he have got it from? Where would he have gone to to get it? Some Dealers. Always dealers. Dealers, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I just want to, I would yeah. long love to know the narrative because well, is this an elephant or... It's an elephant uh, and, and generally ivory at this point was um, recovered from dead elephants. So there was the whole issues that were, them. yeah, mm. there were plenty, but that's, it wasn't plenty, which is why they were rare. Um, mm. But the, the kind of issues that pertain to ivory, which of course so controversial mm. at the moment, um, exactly. uh, right, so rightly it's, so, it's um, is, is a, mm. are, are different at that point. And yes, mm. you're absolutely right in what you said at the beginning, that this was seen as a, as a natural marvel that, and of course it's whiteness and, mm. and so on and so forth meant it precious. And, and the fact that it came from so far away and that mm. people didn't really understand a huge amount about the origins mm. of this piece made it sort of miraculous in its own right. So mm. that kind of miraculousness that's then attached by obsessive craft um, becomes, you know, as you they rightly become, said, yeah, yeah. They, 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 yeah. they join. And it, it, I suppose it's just a sort of lingering question that if you're given a block of ivory you then repeat a kind of image an iconography mm -hmm. that has been in stone or bronze and that that the the 20th century unlocked a kind of relationship with materials that is in a way counter to that I'm not in quite some sure about that actually I have to say I think that in with ivory it has its own discipline um, it has its makes its own demands and it, it, it again it oh, expects sure, a certain yeah. kind of mm. viewing um, so it's not just a repetition of something that's been made in another medium I think it is actually mm. incredibly medium specific and um, and mm. the fiddliness um, which sometimes we resist now yes. the virtuosity yeah. um, however you want to call it is 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 absolutely part of that and because of the kind of Kunstkammer um, uh, context for it, mm. then, then, then that um, that notion of terribly close inspection, mm. which in this case becomes charged inspection because um, because of the subject matter. I think mm. many of them were exactly executive toys, and many of the early ones are, are rather sort of ghastly exercises mm. in um, in making rings that all intersect and you don't know how it happens, that kind of thing. But this isn't to me. It has. No. It takes I mean, some of that. I'm just trying to sort of get my bearings. 
yes, head and heart around it, you know, and, and struggling a bit. And that's why I'm fascinated by it, because it, I find it provocative, you know, in, in terms of where the skill mm. sits in relationship to it as an, a thing to be experienced, a thing of struggle and anguish and <laughs> about to fade, you know, something that's a few scenes further on and it would be very different, yeah. So these recumbent figures. Well, what we're looking at just I briefly find. here is, mm. is the figure of um, Adonis. This was in a Venetian palace um, by uh, Antonio Corradini, who was a local sculptor but had enormous success across Europe, finishing in, in Naples. He's particularly celebrated for his sculptures of women and seen through veils. So veiling is a very um, key aspect for him. Um, this again is a recent acquisition. Um, we know there was a companion sculpture of, of Venus in the same room, but that's now lost. Um, and this is, we're not showing any more angles of, of this of mm. piece so the than this one, because the back, although the back is very fascinating, mm. it wasn't ever designed to be seen. So mm. this comes back to that question a bit. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the reclining question in a minute. Mm. But it comes back a bit to that question of, is this, is this really a sort of pictorial sculpture? Mm. Um, it's very, very sketchy in, its, in the way it was made. It's rather fascinating from that mm. point of view. You can mm. just, I mean, for example, just look here at that line between the thumb and the forefinger. It's, it's mm. carved quickly and, and, and straight up, somewhat exaggeratedly. This is the moment when um, uh, Tiepolo is painting in Venice. Um, mm. And I think to some degree, he's trying to find an ease in marble that Tiepolo found in, in paint, a kind of quickness and, uh, and flourish. Um, the, um, the, the veil here is the veil of sleep. Um, we, I think we have to imagine him stirring as we move closer to it. And we can get that sense that he's, he's just coming, about to, maybe about to wake up because of this, this weird dog's head that um, pops up here. Um, I realized after looking at this piece for some time that animals, um, you know, whereas, the rest, well, whereas we human beings sort of drag ourselves out of bed and grow and wake up slowly, animals, animals suddenly stir um, when, they're, when they're disturbed. They'll lift their head in that way and that immediate attention. And so somehow this, this dog for me is the, uh, and is the, is the beautiful narrative contrast to, to the sleep and our sense of, of, of coming upon him um, is accentuated by that. Mm. The story, of course, is about Venus falling in, in love, and the question is the degree to which this, um, this sculpture makes you feel fall in love, and whether that recliningness is part of the, um, mm. the, the, the love. Mm. Mm. I think the, the dog's nose represents quite a sort of phallic <laughs> intrusion <Good>. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the otherwise completely passive creature. Um, again, I think the twisted body, you know, the knees coming towards us and the flattening of the chest. I think recumbent figures, the amount of space they actually occupy in the block intrigues me. It's such a narrow, a narrow space that gets, um, you know, pulled and pushed in all these directions and burrowed into. I think this is where, for me, the light and dark of stone really comes it into its own with these reclining figures. You know, the fact that the dark shadows go right in underneath the body. But again, to me, this is very much part of a kind of Christ-like iconography. I can imagine this um, almost like a figure on the cross, if you put it upright. There's a strange sense that this is still relying on Christian iconography to inform it in some way. I don't know. What about the erotic in that, though? I mean, because you, I think but you're I think right. The, you the, think that Christ is a... It is an erotic yeah. thing, isn't it? I mean, it, it's, it's the exposure of flesh in that way, mm -hmm. and flesh where you don't know whether it's alive or dead is such an extraordinary phenomena, I think, to um, have as an icon. And I think this is, this is the same. I mean, Adonis mm. usually in this position is dead, yes, isn't he? Yes, yes, yes. And um, so, but he's asleep, yeah. But, 
there are no but wounds, still, but of course no. he's actually pointing. I've just realised as you're talking mm. to the to his chest in in the place where where Christ's wounds might well be. Mm. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time. I haven't got a watch on. Um, okay, perfect. Well, we'll not, we might move through these this this one a little bit more speedily. Quickly, yes, um, yeah. um, I only just. I mean, the only this is a um, a piece of um, a piece that was bought not so long ago, um, and which the Met, to a man and a woman, absolutely hated when, <laughs> when we bought it. Um, the, it. It was, I think they, they found this kind of sensibility sort of deeply creepy. Um, and I mean, it's showing, as you can see, a, a young martyred saint. Um, um, uh, Alexandre Faguier has taken this subject of Saint Ta, I can never remember how you were Tarsicius, I suppose, um, and um, and and there he is in a kind of ecstasy. And it's funny to me that that the Saint Sebastian was greeted with enormous pleasure, mm. in a similar kind of mode. I mean, and I don't know whether that was to do with the period or to do with the um, the fact that he isn't reclining. Mm. And this this sort of um, crawling along the ground uh, in a kind of something which is both martyrdom and ecstasy. Um, really, the, the curator had to fight, I think, to get mm. this into the, into the collection. But, but it's but almost pre-Raphaelite pre sentimentality, isn't it, this one? It's, it's, it's dragging something out. And I think that aspect of sculpture, I, I ap actually love. I love that theatricality, because something that takes up our space and can actually perform, even though it's a completely static thing. I think it's remarkable, regardless of whether I like it or not. There's something where it's so staged what this is. This is. I mean, it doesn't. The actual content of it doesn't con convince me, mm. but the need to really milk the moment is, I think, extraordinary, you know, and to actually... Um, so do you like the, pho the phoniness of it? Yes, almost? I do, I do, um, yes. Like, like the room we've just... The French apartment room, you know, <laughs> sort of... The kind of conviction, sort of strange double, double thing of utter conviction and total phoniness yes, going on yes, at the same and time. The, the um, labour again to actually... Um, make that, to manufacture that and produce that, to hold that in your head over all those weeks of carving that, that I think is extraordinary. I think it's like two things in complete opposition. The moment of the gesture of appealing and the upturned head which looks um, almost like a pop singer, you know, in some way. Um, and you look down on him. Mm. Um, does yeah. that make a difference to the a way? A huge difference, yeah. I think, um, in the sense that we're looking, you know, the emotional behavior, our emotional behavior in relationship to objects and things, whether you're standing looking down or looking at or looking up, I think has a huge influence. 